<laughs> I didn't think this would work. Oh my god. That's so cool. <laughs> Hey, this is Hunter with Lone Star Woodworking, and in this video, we are doing something totally different. If you're new here, what I normally do is the live edge and epoxy tables. But I said in my last video that I felt like I wasn't really challenging myself technically as a woodworker. And so this project is kind of my attempt to breach that barrier into design and forethought in order to successfully actually build something. So... What we're gonna be doing is we're building a Wi-Fi cabinet for my own house. My wife has been asking me for one for about six weeks because right now our Wi-Fi modem and router is stored in a plastic tote with a couch cushion on top of it to prevent my son from getting into it. And it's just kind of this big, ugly thing against our wall and my wife wants it gone. Uh, and I asked her if there was anything I needed to consider when building it. She said, yeah, Parker, our son, cannot move it because he's one and a half years old and has zero sense of self-preservation. So the plugs and the technology actually has to be kind of concealed and cannot be accessed by him moving it. So I'm gonna have to figure out something for that. It has to be tall enough to where he cannot climb on it because right now he's climbing on everything, including things we didn't think he could reach. So I have to make it tall enough to where he can't do that. And then three, we have to be able to access it if we ever need to get to the technology while also denying Parker access. So that's gonna be something else that we need to figure out. That could be something as simple as like a childproof lock. So that's what we're gonna be doing. I am at Houston Hardwoods right now. I'm gonna pick up some white oak and some walnut. We're gonna have kind of a contrasting wood build. Follow along and I really hope y'all enjoy. So I am specifically after four quarter walnut and six quarter white oak. And if those measurements don't make a whole lot of sense to you, the whole quarter measurements thing, it's how the wood industry identifies the thickness of their rough lumber. Rough lumber is stuff that hasn't been planed, hasn't been jointed. It's generally a little bit cheaper and for some reason they identify it with that kind of measurement instead of an inch. So instead of an inch, they say four quarter, inch and a half, six quarter, two inches, eight quarter, so on and so forth. Now there is an absolutely massive selection of both white oak and walnut. It's not terribly surprising. They're two of the most popular species of wood to build furniture out of. So it took me a while just to find the five boards of white oak and the one board of walnut that I needed. But once I did find them, you can easily see here that even though I was digging in the rough section, that's definitely not rough. Houston Hardwoods does offer some milling services, so I asked them to get everything down to S3S for me, or smooth on three sides. They planed two sides and jointed an edge for me. I could have asked for S4S, but there's two things. It's more expensive, and they actually need an entire day's notice in order to get you on that schedule. I don't really understand it. It's just the difference between one jointed edge, but... That's what they required. I wanted to go home with everything that day, so I took the S3S option. Now, normally I'm not one to give a shit about the orientation of grain and boards in these panel glue-ups, but my wife is. And since this is something for her, I wanted it to be something that she was happy to look at every single day because she is one of those people where if there's like this weird area of grain that goes off in a stupid direction, it's going to piss her off every single day. But once everything was decided, I cut every one of these boards down to just over six inches and hit a small snag. Okay, so I'm running into a, a small problem, and it really is just a small problem. Uh, whenever I was at Houston Hardwoods, I did not specify that I needed all of these at the exact same thickness. I just said as thick as possible. So that's on me. And so this is kind of what I'm working with. I've got this lip here and I don't really want to deal with that whenever I go in for the glue ups. So I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do about that. The solution that I came up with is relatively simple but can be very dangerous if you don't do this correctly. Basically the thinnest stock that I had out of Houston Hardwoods planer was an inch and a quarter. So I set my table saw fence to an inch and a quarter, grabbed a thicker stock, flipped it on its side and ran it through the blade like you see me doing here. 
Now I have a 10 inch table saw and these boards were about six inches thick. So the blade comes up about three inches, give or take. It was able to cut pretty much right at the halfway point on the width of these boards. It worked out pretty well, but it was definitely a little bit sketchy. All right, so now you can see that everything is well within tolerance for being able to sand it on all four pieces. Now I get the uh, temptation to go ahead and just truck along with it and just take care of it later, but I promise you that little setup of like two minutes probably saved me a couple hours worth of sanding if I had to do that on all four pieces. So I'm gonna check all four sets again. I'm gonna look through them, uh, see if I need to make the same correction on any more. I did actually have to make that exact same cut on five or six other boards, but I had the process figured out pretty well. Got everything done safely and with all of my appendages intact. So from there, it was time to move on to the panel glue up. And for your panel glue ups, you really want to be careful to not over clamp. This is definitely something that a lot of us are guilty of, especially when we first started uh, going at this whole woodworking thing. And our train of thought is probably the harder I clamp, the better the joint, but you can actually squeeze too much of the glue out. You want to put just enough pressure to where there's an even amount of glue squeeze out across the entire seam. After that, you really don't need to honk down on it anymore. Now, part of some of my 2024 shop resolutions or shop goals was to be more organized and more efficient. And this is part of that organization, using that French cleat wall as an as a system for my clamps and my consumables and all my other things. I actually have a whole nother wall behind my miter saw that you'll see here in a second and behind my workbench. So if you have like organization goals for your shop in 2024, I highly recommend looking into the French cleat system. Now, as I was sanding off the glue squeeze out, one of these boards developed a pretty significant crack. Now this looks bad, but it's really not that bad. This is a side panel. So I knew that all of the stress on this was going to be top to bottom where the grain is absolutely the strongest. So I really wasn't concerned about this crack getting worse over time. And I used the Katz Moses wood movement calculator. This white oak is only supposed to move about a 32nd of an inch inside of my home. So even less concerned about this whole thing getting worse over time. Another big upside to using CA glue is I don't have to wait hours or a whole day before I can actually go back at this. Normally what you would see is a, a person that does this on a more normal basis would probably put wood glue in there and then clamp it together. I just didn't see the necessity for that. Now it's time to make the first clean cut on one of the ends of all of these panels. And you might be asking yourself, why do I need to make a clean cut? Why can't I just run the panel as is through my table saw and ride it against my fence? And the short answer is these glue ups are done by hand. So the probability of you getting all of these boards perfectly square to each other is pretty much zero. So you make that first cut with either a track saw or a miter saw or a circular saw with a straight edge. That straight edge rides along your fence and you're guaranteed to have two parallel edges. And if you're building a box, those are kind of a requirement. Now, one of the things I had to take into consideration when I was building my wife's coffee table was the fact that our son is eventually going to start walking and he's gonna hit his head on things regardless of what we do. No matter how much we baby proof things, he's gonna find something to smack his head on and it's always gonna hurt. But the idea that we had was, okay, well maybe we can mitigate stitches by getting rid of these big sharp edges. So I put a giant half inch round over on every single sharp edge and I rounded over all of the corners with a nice big round radius. And we were trying to kind of continue with that theme here. So I used that small router base in order to draw these big roundovers, but I didn't have a router bit big enough to do that. And I saw Keith Johnson use a technique exactly like this when he was building some legs for a desk where he had to sculpt a oval shaped leg out of square stock. 
and he used his table saw to remove the bulk of material and then finished off the finer details with his hand plane and a sander, kind of going back and forth, getting as close to his line as he possibly could. This is obviously not on that big of a scale, but I figured the same technique could be applied. And this was the result. It's not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. I had a small hump as a result of the 45 and 15 degree cut, but it just took a little bit of sanding in order to smooth everything out. I was trying to keep everything as rounded over and uniform throughout the entire distance of this, this panel as I could. I'm not entirely satisfied with it, but for this being my first time attempting this type of round over technique, I think this is about as good as I could have done for a first try. So what I'm going to do here is something that actually I'm pretty proud that I thought of it because it's something that if I didn't watch a few videos on how to do this, I definitely would have just blew right past it. I'm going to pre-finish sand the inside of these panels because once this thing is glued up, it's going to be very difficult to sand everything properly. Now I wanted the side panels to be just a little bit shorter and it was right here that I realized I was making the cut the wrong way. I was going parallel with my roundovers instead of perpendicular. I gave myself the head shake of disapproval, cussed at myself a few times, and made the cut the right way. Now, unfortunately, you can still see a little bit of the miscut, but that's actually not going to be a concern here in a few minutes because I actually end up cutting it off anyway. But for right now, when I was doing my dry mock-up, I was just kind of getting prepared to deal with that. And so far for this dry mock-up, everything is looking good. Everything's lining up the way I want it to. Everything is sitting the way it needs to in order for this to glue up successfully. So I started figuring out how I was going to glue this thing up because anytime I've tried to build a box, I always fight with the side panels because if I don't glue everything at a perfect 90, those panels slide because glue acts as a lubricant and everything slips all over the place. So this was the idea I had to mitigate that. I'm gonna countersink some screws into the bottom. You're never gonna see these, which is why I'm doing it into the bottom. And then I'm just gonna screw it directly into the side panels. So that way there's already some clamping pressure and I don't have to sit here and fight with it whenever I put the top on. So here you'll see there's a little bit of glue squeeze out. I was pretty happy to see that, seeing that the screws already were giving a pretty good amount of clamping pressure. And now I don't have to fight with this at all. Everything is staying up at a perfect 90. I was pretty happy with the way things were going here. I got the top set on and positioned it right where I wanted it, added a clamp, made sure that I had enough glue squeeze out, made sure that nothing was shifting on me and that nothing was getting pulled in a weird direction. After that, I applied every clamp I had in order to get some good glue squeeze out. Now, while this thing was in the clamps and drying, my wife went out and looked at it and she said, hey, that looks like it's gonna come off the wall really, really far. How deep is it? And I said, it's two feet deep. It's a two inch or a two foot cube. And she said, yeah, I think we're gonna need to trim that down. And I said, okay, well, how much do you wanna trim it down? And she said, I'm not sure. And I said, okay, well, let's start with six inches and see where that gets us. So while I was preparing to do that, I, went, I wanted to show you this really cool vacuum switch that I got for my birthday. It's really cool because I am one of those people that does constantly forget to turn on my dust collection, especially when I operate my table saw. And this kind of just eliminates the need to remember that. It's pretty cool and it's like 30 bucks off of Amazon. It's 100% worth it. And just like with every single video, there's gonna be a link down in the description for everything that I've been using in this video. And you can see right there, there's that off cut from whenever I made the wrong cut the wrong way. So it was able to come off and I was pretty happy to see that I no longer had to worry about that. There were these little screw scars, I guess, that I had to contend with, but that's no big deal. I just moved the table saw fence over another quarter inch and trimmed them off, no big deal. 
It was right about here that I think my wife was saying I make her super nervous by getting my hand so close to the blade, but I feel like I was pretty safe. And this was the end result. I was pretty happy with it, and that's one of those small details. It was gonna be against the wall, but I knew that if my wife knew those were there, it would bother her. Now I did inset the side panels just a little bit so that way I could flush trim everything to fit perfectly, and this worked out the way I wanted it to. Everything looked pretty good. A little bit of sanding and everything's gonna be nice and even. Now I'm gonna start jumping around a little bit between building the door and working on the cabinet, so just kind of bear with me. But how cool does that walnut look? That grain movement is just absolutely gorgeous. Now this is the first piece that I was cutting. Wanted to make sure that the length that I was cutting everything to was going to fit and give me the right reveal that I wanted on either side. Everything looked good, so I cut out three more pieces and trimmed everything down to six inches. And I'm gonna do the same process that I did with the white oak where I actually take a little bit of time. I'm going to work through all the different pieces that I cut. I'm gonna to try to pick the best grain orientation this one was a little bit more difficult because there was so much movement in this walnut grain that it was really difficult to line anything up that was going to make it look relatively seamless. I went out, I consulted my wife, I asked her, I was like, hey, I can't really find a good thing for this. Can you come out here and help? She came out, she helped me out, she picked something that she liked. It really didn't take her long, so that was pretty good to see. Now this is a pretty good example of that clamping pressure I'm talking about. I'm incrementally increasing the pressure on my pipe clamps until I get nice even glue squeeze out, then I just stop. Now while everything was glued up and kind of working through all of that, I was going to go ahead and cut out some test pieces for legs. And it's a really simple design. It's just a three and a quarter inch square with a 30 inch bevel or cut right there. And I wanted her to choose between walnut and white oak. She immediately gravitated towards the walnut, so I said, cool. Cut out a bunch of these three and a quarter inch squares, and I had to cut out a bunch more of them because these were only an inch thick, and I wanted the legs to be a little bit beefier. So I cut out eight of them and glued them together to make four legs. And while those were glued up, I went ahead and moved on to the kind of childproofing aspect of everything here, softening up all these edges with a nice big half inch roundover bit. And this was a really good idea that I had, but unfortunately I just didn't have the experience to put it into practice. I wanted to put a shadow line in between where the end grain met that face grain of these panels. I thought it would just be a really cool way of breaking up where that seam is at, but I had a small slip of the hand. Yeah, this was pretty bad. Uh, I wasn't very happy with myself. I thought I was moving slow enough. I thought I had clamped everything down good enough, but I didn't. I tried to take the opportunity to work on a skill that I haven't really exercised too much and uh, Yeah, that's about as well as it went. And like shit is about how it looked. I was not happy with this. I don't have very good chisels. I have the little DeWalt set that you can get from Home Depot that really aren't worth the price that you pay for them. So lesson learned for me, lesson learned for you. It's not a hard lesson to learn, but what does suck is that I am cutting off the big roundovers that I put on there. So unfortunately that cool technique I did with my table saw was kind of a waste. But sometimes that's just the way these things go. So I went ahead and just settled for putting this half inch round over on it, just like every other edge on this box. And in the end, I don't hate it. It actually looks okay. I just really wish that I had that kind of handmade aspect of those um, round overs. Now the shadow lines, all of them were a little bit janky, so I cut out some strips and inlaid them, and the idea that I actually had was to go back and try to redo the shadow line. But I ended up liking the way this looked so much that I decided to go ahead and just leave them in there. Now while those inlays were drying, I went ahead and put the 
door panel and the legs out of their clamps and started working on those separately. I put the little 30 degree cut on all the legs that I wanted. I think that this was a pretty nice design. It looks better than just having some square legs and in my opinion looks better than just having some regular triangular legs. I like the combination of square and angular. That's just me though. Sanding everything up to 120 on those legs. Probably didn't have to go that high, probably just enough to look good, but it made me feel good to put them all the way up there. Sanded that door panel all the way up to 120. And I told you I'm gonna kind of jump around a little bit, so I let the glue dry a little bit on those inlays, flush trimmed them, and here is where I decided that that actually looked kind of cool. And I liked the way it hid the transition between that end grain and the long grain. Now this is something that is totally foreign to me, is using hinges. I have never built anything as a cabinet. I've never built anything that required hinges like this. I've used the piano hinges to build a box before, but only once. So the idea of using hinges that are designed for inset doors was a totally foreign concept to me. And you're gonna see that very apparently here in a little bit. Now, the issue that I was running into there is that the edge of the walnut here was kind of catching on the outside edge of the white oak. So the idea that I had was to just kind of trim it off a little bit so that way it could slide in there. Long story short, that didn't work out. I ended up cutting the panel too short. And so that's what I am trying to correct here. I made this little frame out of some scrap walnut that I had laying around. These are definitely hugely oversized, but I wanted that so that I could trim them down to the proper size that I need in order to make this work. And this little four-way clamp is pretty awesome. I bought it uh, about two years ago and used it once and it's been sitting on my rack ever since. And I'm happy it's one of those tools that I didn't get rid of because it came in real handy here. I was pretty satisfied with the way everything looked after the glue had cured up a little bit. And this is what I was trying to do whenever I got the white oak out of its panel glue up. So I was trying to wait while the glue was still a little bit wet so that I could just scrape it off with some chisels. It just looks cleaner in, in my opinion. It's a little bit easier to sand it that way. There's really nothing wrong with waiting for the glue to cure all the way and just sanding it off. Now I'm just sanding off any little inconsistencies that might have occurred whenever I put the frame onto the panel. No big deal, just going at this with 80 grit, getting everything down to its proper height and width. And I think the door ended up needing to be some weird, uh, weird measurements. It was like 20 and six or seven thirty seconds something like that like it was a very very small measurement that I had to try to get down to in order to get the reveal that I wanted I used some playing card shims in order to get the reveal that I needed and wanted and I found out that the hinges I was using was actually the totally wrong hinge to use I needed something called European style hinges for inset doors and so I went to Home Depot found that exact style. You need a 35 millimeter Forstner bit in order to inlay the hardware. And I mean, it really wasn't difficult. So I, I attached everything with some screws and I think everything went pretty okay. Got a little bit excited here, didn't catch on the white oak. And you'll hear my excitement in just a sec. I didn't think this would work. Oh my God, that's so cool. <laughs> so yeah, if it wasn't clear, I really did not expect that to work. And I was very happy with the way everything fit. I was very happy with the way everything closed and went together. So with that, I took the door off, got everything finished sanded up to 180, put a soft pad in order to get on all of those roundovers and keep that nice roundover nice and clean. 
And then I needed a handle and I did not want a metal handle that you can get from Home Depot, like those cabinetry handles. I wanted one out of white oak. I wanted a wooden handle. And this is the idea I came up with just using that cove bit, making this little handle out of some white oak. I'm not even gonna overcomplicate the attachment process. I just used CA glue and got it about as centered as I possibly could. Using the same technique with the legs here, not trying to overcomplicate it. I do not anticipate that this cabinet is going to get thrashed around or dragged or anything like that. So I think that the legs attached like this with some CA glue will work just fine. Now this is apparently a common issue that you get with these European style hinges. Those inset doors tend to wanna go a little bit further than flush with the edges of whatever the cabinet is. So you just need to put a little stopper piece right there. You can see the shadow of it at the top of the box and everything sat nice and flush. I was pretty happy with that. Now I said at the top of this video that I needed to find a way to make sure that Parker cannot move this thing because this kid is ridiculously strong. So the idea that I had is I was just gonna put some white oak backers right here, pre-drill some holes, and I was gonna use some drywall screws in order to attach it directly to the wall. Pay careful attention if you choose to do this and don't use a screw that's too long because there are wires and electricity behind that wall. And finally, the moment that I have been trying to get to after hours of work and trying to figure out how things work with this kind of cabinetry and furniture, I got to the finish and it looks so freaking good. I by no means think that this cabinet is perfect, but I think this is about as good as I can possibly get it for a first try. Now, remember, this is what we had. So now it's time to take this whole thing apart, get rid of it, finally get rid of this big eyesore against our wall. And I'm sitting there and as I'm doing this, I'm kind of taking directions from my wife. She's telling me to move the box over left, move the box over right. Now I actually had someone reach out to me on TikTok. He's a woodworker who apparently works for this same company that my Wi-Fi and router are, are for or with. And he said that I need to be very careful to make sure that I could actually ventilate it because if it gets over 100 degrees, then it will actually shut off in order to save itself. So that was a really cool piece of advice. It's really nice of him to reach out and give me that free advice. Now, I do not think that the ventilation is going to be an issue. My house stays pretty cool year round as it is. And yeah, it's just not really a huge concern for me. Now, one of the last things I said we needed to do in order to make sure this was Parker proof is put some baby locks on it so that way he can't just open this box and get to it. And these baby locks, it's something that we had and they work just fine. Now guys, for reference, this is what we started with. My wife sketched this up on her iPad just to kind of give me an idea of what she wanted. And this was great, it was great to start with, but this is what we finished with. I was incredibly happy with this. My wife was incredibly happy with this. It looks so much better than that stupid plastic tote. And guys, that is the end of this video. This is the finished product. This is its home. We're very happy with it. And y'all, if you stuck around this long just to watch me build a box, first off, I really appreciate it. And I really think you should consider hitting that subscribe button because I have a whole lot more like this coming your way. I'm still gonna do the live edge and epoxy stuff, but I really would like to integrate more of this stuff into my videography and my, my woodworking. So guys, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something and I really hope to see you next time. See ya.